Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Uh, so my name is Micah Erlis. I'm with Accenture. I lead our Web3 technology group for North America, uh, also our emerging technology architecture group globally. And uh, with me here is the distinguished York Rhodes from Microsoft, uh, the founder of blockchain at Microsoft, uh, and a director there of, would you say, supply chain and the strategy and transformation. Uh, a supply chain guru as well. Um, and so w there's an interesting parallel that we want to just highlight today. And this is more of uh, less of a blueprint and more of just a way to think about the world. It's not novel necessarily. Um, but for anyone in the supply chain industry, we always say you probably see everything as a supply chain, right? And so we've seen the same with data. Uh, and data sets. And so the reason we're bringing it up today is because as we get into this, maybe call it an emerging new age or a re-emerging age of data and AI, and AI at least the attention toward it, um, we're seeing it, it's a opportune time to kind of talk about some of the similarities because a lot of these uh, nuances are getting magnified, okay? Um, very simple, there's one slide, so we'll get into it, but York, please. I was going to say, when, when you think about the word supply chain, what you really want to think about is the words global trade, because global trade runs on supply chain. And so supply chain might sound boring, but global trade is how the world runs. Um, so really, really important connection between physical and digital goods movement and company ownership and transactions. So just a really important point um, that I sort of realized when promoting my new class at NYU. <laughs> Yeah, so let's just really uh, put these four words up here to kind of talk through the differences, again, nuance around them. I've got a really nice use case to share with you that York and I are working on, um, and, and then thinking about how do we balance all of these needs. So call them requirements, call them non-functional or functional, depending on your view, but um, there's traceability, and again, think about it from supply chains, but immediately you also see where there's a need for this in data sets. Uh, traceability, back to the provenance, back to the source, right? How do we prove or at least a test or make a claim that something is where it's com coming from where it's said to? Uh, along with that, how much confidence? So that's where I get the difference between proof and attestation we talk about all the time. It's really how much confidence do I have in this? Um, and we'll, we'll get into there's a reason why that's important um, and there's a road to more confidence I would say um, and then on the on the security or the, the privacy preserving side you can talk about confidentiality uh, and then specifically around anonymity so confidential how how confidential or how do we keep confidentiality of data sets right uh, of, of specific pieces of it and maybe you're doing selective disclosure uh, so you're disclosing some but not others and then uh, anonymity of identity so talk on a supply chain there's a definite need um, for if we're going to do anything decentralized in this space uh, for that to be a clear distinction what is the unique universal ID of an entity that doesn't really exist today right um, so York maybe you can talk us through a bit about the use case we're look we're looking at uh, currently Absolutely. Um, so, driven by regulations, we're now in a new market that was voluntary and is now mandatory. And so, every brand is facing what I like to call an existential risk, which is my goods can be stopped at the border if there's a suspicion that there is forced labor in my supply chain. And I use the word suspicion very specifically because that's actually what the regulation says. There's a presumption of guilt um, in, in this scenario, and there's um, top-down inference tools that are being used to arrive at this presumption of guilt. And then it is incumbent upon the brands to then prove in very complex supply chains where they don't know who the suppliers are um, through sets of evidence and data that they're actually not they don't have bad actors in the supply chain, um, and bad actors very specifically are things like where people are involved in forced labor scenarios of all different types. Um, forced labor is a very broad term as well. Um, but that's basically the use case. And if you think about this problem from a scope perspective, um, this 
be useful, uh, useful way to think about this because sometimes we think about things in the small. This is a world global trade ecosystem problem. And just in a high-tech ecosystem where you have very complicated goods like servers and racks and um, laptops, there are many, many components similar to the airline industry or the car industry. Um, and uh, tip typical trade relationships that are proprietary um, between a buyer and a seller um, are a one to four relationship, right? Like I might have four suppliers for every part for diversification and, and risk reduction. Um, so you have a, essentially between every two tiers of the supply chain, you have a one to four relationships. Um, and from a math perspective, going back to the point about how do you figure out what's the size of this animal, um, you can then do a four to the power n, where n is the number of tiers you think you have in your supply chain. So four to the 13th is 67 million. So if we assume that we have at least 13 tiers in our supply chain, that means there are 13 million, or sorry, 67 million entities, to Micah's point, that are unknown to us uh, as a brand. Uh, and that we now have to prove, if our things get stopped at the border, that there's no forced labor in these unknown entities uh, with a set of evidence that we don't have without any way to collect it. So that's why I call it an existential risk. Um, and the regulations actually, frankly, are good um, because they create a level playing field for all brands. Um, in a voluntary market, you know, different people are doing different things. And so if one group cracks down on a particular activity, those people involved in that activity would just go somewhere else, right? By the regulations, at least for Europe and the US, are pretty aligned. Um, so they create a level playing field for anybody trying to ship across the border in uh, Europe and in, and in the US. So that's sort of the broad scope of the problem. Um, and that goes back to the point that I made earlier, which is this is a global trade problem. It's not a supply chain problem. Um, it's both. Um, and so it's a really important point. Um, the other reason why these principles are important is because if anyone knows how global trade operates since ancient Rome, uh, basically, you know, I don't tell you who my suppliers are or who my buyers are or how much I'm transacting, or when, or with what goods, right? It's all proprietary, which is why it's opaque, which is why the end buyer or producer of consumer product good doesn't necessarily know who those 67 million suppliers are, right, in a very deep supply chain. Yeah, thank you. And so it's funny, this sort of statement that we're, we're starting with as a thesis uh, came up between conversation York and I were having with Kirk McEwen from Carbon Arc, a uh, good friend and, and partner of ours. We were realizing, hey, there is a lot of parallel between what you do with a supply chain and physical goods and what you see with data. And so... Um, Kirk actually had an interesting uh, hypothesis as well, and his thought is hey, data is essentially commodity at this point. I mean, you can purchase a lot of, anyone can purchase the data sets in the world. Uh, how you put those together is what becomes then unique, and so what he calls those are insights. So you could see a need in a world in which we decentralize data ownership, where, yeah, data is part of it, and some, everyone's bringing unique data to to certain cases, that's fine, but it quickly becomes commoditized when they can sell it. Um, but once you put, package that into an insight, uh, that I think is more likely worth putting a token to and tokenizing, right? And then how do you trace and track that token's, again, origin and then all the way through the marketplace? Um, there's a, a obvious use case there for a decentralized uh, approach. And so whether you're making claims that are verifiable with verifiable credentials or you're using VCs for identity purposes and how do we identify whose is what and who's working on the supply chain, the different entities. Um, again, I'm, I'm kind of mixing quickly. You can see this, this, the parallels between physical supply chain and data supply chain. It's all really uh, same patterns. And so it'd be interesting to see, you know, we're, we're looking at a couple patterns on the physical goods side uh, for this use case. Uh, York, I'll let you touch on which you'd like to divulge and not, um, and, and maybe we can, you know, take any questions after that. So I think um, 
The interesting thing that you mentioned, and since we're at consensus, um, the problem with most tokens today, right, is that they are fully transparent, right, when they're on chain. And so we have to be extremely thoughtful about um, how do we protect the relationship data that ha that exists within the token, as well as the actual attribute data about the transaction and things like that as well. So I think that's a really important lens here, which goes to one of the points on the, on the slide. Um, and that sort of leads you to, well, how do I protect data on chain versus off chain? What choices do I make? Um, how do I how do I think about the world in the context of a, net, a network of participating actors? Um, how do I keep the footprint low enough um, in these 67 million uh, participants in global trade in a particular ecosystem uh, that you can actually get them onboarded? Um, and you know you can quickly see that this is a very very complicated problem. Um, and so from an approach perspective, What's really interesting, I think, about this ecosystem is um, we've been working both in the decentralized identity world as well as in the blockchain space on core concepts that actually help solve these problems. Um, and some are actually quite mature concepts and some are emerging. Um, when I say concepts, I mean usage of, of technology. So for example, um, obviously um, the decentralized identity and the verifiable claim work is something I also started in 2016 at Microsoft. Um, but actually knew that it was going to be at least six years before it was mature enough. And so I spent all my time in blockchain um, in the meantime. Um, but one of the things that we see in, in the blockchain space is a lot of people really focused on this off-chain, off-chain, on-chain, off-chain best practices, which gives you variability in terms of how you handle privacy. Um, and also on-chain privacy um, through tools like zero knowledge uh, cryptography and also uh, more emergent is uh, fully homomorphic encryption technology um, which i say emergent the patterns are there what's not yet there is scale so people often talk about what is the scale problem with privacy um, in a zero knowledge on-chain scenario uh, or a confidential compute scenario, it's typically the proving encryption uh, that, that is the, the thing that takes longer. Um, and so in any world where we have these principles, um, we have to have data privacy, we have to not reveal relationships between buyers and suppliers, but we still have to get guarantees. Um, and so this is where we're really looking at these patterns of verifiable claims and zero knowledge uh, and different ways to provide those guarantees at scale in a concept where we need data availability, another common term in the Web3 space, where we also need effectively roll-ups um, so that we can actually arrive at a final proof that says, I proved every step of the way that I have all the right documentation and therefore I've got guarantees of evidence availability if needed and I've got guarantees that it actually has some sense of the right evidence that's available. Um, so that's sort of the starting point. Yeah, thanks. I, I think there's plenty of tools and so those of you who are familiar with the tool sets within the Hyperledger uh, stack, you know, there are plenty of those that can be applicable here. Um, and, and by the way, we're more than, you know, it's more than just fabric these days, right? So Besu has, uh, some, is it 15%, Daniela? 14% of mainnet runs through uh, Hyperledger Besu. Um, quite progress, uh, quite a bit of progress. Um, mainnet, Ethereum mainnet, yes, yes. Uh, and so, you know, I'd in general, there are a lot of solutions that still need to be built. And so for those of you in the developer community watching this uh, and those of you out here who are at the conference who are builders, um, there's a need for these solutions, again, not just on the physical but also on the data set side of their respective supply chains. Um, perhaps you can find a shortcut to build something that's applicable for both. There's obvious parallels and overlap. Um, again, not a new necessarily novel perspective, uh, but in this age, I think it's worth bringing up again. Uh, that this is a parallel that's going to be very important, I believe, coming uh, in the next decade and even you know sooner than that. Um, and so we're seeing, starting to see different enterprises across every industry, right? This is applicable. It's industry agnostic, uh, these problems and the solutions for them. So thanks, York, for joining. And thanks, Hyperledger, for having us.